the last 70 years have seen the most momentous changes in British criminal justice and policing. And throughout those decades, television has played a highly significant role. Sometimes TV didn't just document these changes by highlighting miscarriages of justice, corruption and damning flaws in police procedure. It became a powerful agent for change. Reform was sometimes prompted by what appeared to be injustice. David! In 1955, Ruth Ellis shot her lover to death and stood trial for murder. The sentence of the court upon you is death by hanging. The decision to execute this 28-year-old, a mother of two children, fueled what was already a fierce debate over capital punishment. The issue of gay law reform was equally controversial. For many of us, this is revolting, men dancing with men. Homosexuals in this country today break the law. I'll ask why lawmakers seem to have failed in certain areas. The mythologies of rape have the power to transform the woman victim into the guilty party. Someone is the biggest lot of bollocks I've ever heard. I can get very annoyed very shortly. Changes in the law prompted huge change in society too. So how far was television able to illuminate or even shape events during those momentous decades? In times gone by, justice was delivered in a kind of travelling roadshow. In market towns like this one, the more serious criminal cases were allowed to stack up until a circuit judge arrived every three months or so. There was a courtroom and a very comfortable suite of rooms where his lordship could relax after a busy day's adjudicating. But for the hundreds, thousands of defendants over the centuries waiting to hear their fate, it was anything but relaxing. When the law was at its most savage at the end of the 18th century, there were roughly 200 crimes for which the punishment was execution. The issue of whether it's morally correct, whether it's even a useful deterrent to execute wrongdoers has been argued for centuries and came to a head in this country 60 years ago. Even in the 1980s, Parliament continued to debate the issue. And as they did so, Time Watch asked, why 200 years earlier did hanging enter its heyday? Then, as now, Parliament was faced with a rising crime rate. There was little doubt in the 18th century that murder deserved punishment by death. But the Act of 1722 vastly extended the crimes for which death could be incurred. Significantly, many sentences set out not so much to protect life, but property. At all events, the total more than doubled, and the Newgate Calendar, a contemporary account of celebrated trials and executions, carried a detailed list. Bigamy. Burglary. Cattle naming. Deer stealing. Destroying turnpikes. Felony. Forgery. Footpath robbery. Highway robbery. High treason. Horse stealing. Murder. Petty treason. Piracy. Rescuing bodies from surgeons. Rape. Riot mobbing. Sheep stealing. Street robbery. Unnatural crime. Wrecking. But this draconian so-called bloody code proved too harsh to be effective. The most important thing here is proportionality. Uh, and actually, we see during this, this period of time, the bloody code, where we have over 200 offences punishable by death, that punishments became out of kilter. And so juries increasingly would fail to convict or find other ways uh, to kind of reduce the punishment. Jurors would uh, uh, say this man or woman is guilty of stealing to the value of 39 shillings, where 40 shillings was the capital cut-off point. And complaints were made frequently, for example, in the, in the House of Lords, that uh, the law tended to be unenforceable. The last execution at Tyburn took place in 1783. The last public execution in Britain was in 1868, after which hanging continued within prison walls, but less frequently with each passing decade. By the 1950s, the list of capital crimes had effectively been whittled down to one, murder, if you discount one or two exotic offences like piracy or treason. 
The debate over whether to finally abolish the death penalty was one of the most hotly contested issues of the era. In 1961, the BBC explored the question, gathering evidence from historians, lawyers, politicians, and the government's official hangman. Behind these walls, in awful secrecy, the servants of the public carry out the public will. They dispose of a human being. And if the crime has made the front page of the newspapers, we follow each detail of his fate as closely as we can. Before considering whether we should continue to hang men and women, here precisely is what is done to them. These facts were given in evidence before the Royal Commission. Here are a few notes on what happens when they manage to be executed. The execution chamber is usually next door to the condemned cell. It is a small room with a trap in the centre of the floor. I used to arrange that the prisoner has his back to us when I come in, in case he might get excited. Then when I am inside, I fasten his arms behind his back with a leather strap. Then the prisoner is escorted out of the condemned cell into the execution chamber and is placed on a white chalk mark so that his feet are across the division of the trap. While my assistant is fastening up his legs, I draw a white cap over his head and place a noose round his neck. The knot is a secret of it. We have to put it on the left lower jaw. When he falls, it finishes underneath the chin and throws the chin back. But if the knot is on the right hand side, it would finish up behind his neck and throw his neck forward, which would be strangulation. He might live on the rope for a quarter of an hour then. As soon as I see that everything is ready, I pull the lever and the prisoner falls through it. And it is all over in an instant. We are a Christian country and this is a problem for Christians. The Archbishop of Canterbury. The existence of the death penalty uh, leads to uh, not a strengthening, but a, a, a weakening uh, of the sense of the infinite value uh, of human life. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael Ramsey, mobilized the bench of bishops. I think there were about 16 of them uh, uh, who had voting powers but also, more importantly, had immense moral authority. An organised and energetic campaign to abolish capital punishment in England already exists. Its members claim that the fears of society are largely irrational and that the death penalty serves no useful purpose. Indeed, that it does more harm than good. One of its spokesmen is the Queen's counsel, Mr Gerald Gardner. To kill a man because you're angry with him for what he's done, is too close to the thing he's done himself. And we're sure that we should be a cleaner and a healthier country without it. But there are men who feel equally strongly that capital punishment must be kept. Here is a Conservative member of Parliament who has made a special study of the problem and who speaks for the retentionists, Sir Thomas Moore. What are you going to put in this place if you abolish capital punishment? As far as I can gather from my critics and opponents, the only thing is permanent life imprisonment. What an appalling thought. What a cynical, despairing thought. That you would crucify a man in prison all his natural life. That you would see him rot away before you in body and soul and in mind. Surely, even the most cynical, the most determined opponent of capital punishment would not put any human being into that appalling position. It was one of those rare issues where the vast majority of the public were believed to think one way in favour of capital punishment, yet MPs might be prepared to defy the public mood. We have experts from the Home Office who are working in the field as, as well as, as politicians and they're very much pushing forward their liberal agenda on matters of crime, which dominated post-war penal policy. So such a change now when we see it's just all about populist policies, etc., etc. Back then, uh, it was about what was sort of good for the country uh, and actually weren't particularly interested in hearing what the public had to say on this matter. On December 21st, 1964, Panorama staged a live debate as the House of Commons itself debated the bill to suspend the death penalty. In two and a half hours from now, we shall know whether or not hanging for murder is likely to be abolished in Great Britain. At this moment, the House of Commons is locked in debate on capital punishment. 
there'll be a free vote at 11 o'clock. This particular penalty for particular people, namely professional criminals, is the one real deterrent. This particular argument about deterrence, of course, is the standard argument that's been put for 150 years and has always been proved wrong. The bill was passed shortly after Panorama went off air. The death penalty for murder was set aside on a trial basis the following year. Legislation for a permanent ban followed in 1969 in Great Britain and in 1973 in Northern Ireland. But for the next 30 years, the Commons would repeatedly debate the question of restoring the death penalty. It wasn't until 1998 that it was finally removed from the statute book for all types of crime. Don't you want to carry on living? No. I want to. The following year, a BBC drama documentary looked afresh at one of the most controversial cases of the century, one which dramatically highlighted the need for reform. Don't you believe in God? Ruth Ellis's case became a sensation. The hacks had a tale which was beyond their wildest dreams. The shooting by a glamorous model from a poor background of her lover, an adulterous upper-class racing driver, and the prospect of a hanging. Class, sex and death. The perfect story. Ruth Ellis was the last woman to be hanged, put to death by the hangman we heard from earlier, Albert Pierpoint. But the programme makers argued that had the trial taken place in a later era, the court would have understood far better what was going on in Ruth Ellis's mind. If Ruth Ellis was not to forfeit her life for taking her lover's life so brutally, the defence had to demonstrate vividly the scale of the provocation she'd suffered at David Blakely's hands. Had they succeeded, it is possible that the judge or the jury would have urged mercy. Ruth's childhood was blighted by sexual abuse, inflicted by her own father. It's an upsetting story. Her older sister was also raped by him, became pregnant, and had to confess what had happened to their mother. And so I had to tell her, and she didn't believe me. You actually told her what? That your father I used to raped say it was, it was Daddy. Her mother then failed to protect Ruth from her father. Well, Ruth told me Daddy tried to put his um, singy, she called it, between her legs and all that and tried to perform on her and he kept tight to her till he satisfied himself. So, but she didn't say it like that, she just said he kept hanging on to her. Today, such abuse would certainly be relevant to Ruth's defence of provocation. So we asked a leading criminal psychiatrist, Dr Gillian Mezzi, to assess Ruth's mental state. Her evidence has been used to defend successfully women who've killed their partners. She was certainly physically abused. It sounds as if it was a very unhappy, loveless uh, family to grow up in. Um, and it would have, I think, created, if you like, a backdrop to the later series of abusive relationships she entered into. I just have an overwhelming and uncontrollable desire to kill him. But as the trial date grew closer, in the summer of 1955, Ruth's image as a vengeful assassin seemed firmly set in the public mind. I don't care about the law. Crowds streamed to the old Bailey, queuing for seats. Ruth Ellis faced a formidable prosecution team led by Christmas Humphreys, who'd prosecuted some of the most notorious hangings of the period. He was a particularly effective and theatrical operator. Before the trial, her solicitor had sent to counsel a list from A to Z of her problems. His points were strikingly similar to those made by psychiatrists today dealing with battered women's syndrome. But many were never mentioned at trial. Ruth was damned. Without all that mitigating evidence, she was a divorcee. She'd worked as an escort, she had lovers, and more crucially, the man she shot was a younger lover from a very different social class. So all those things would have made her seem doubly deviant. She was doomed. David! The cold and detached, almost dazed quality that's described in the notes is very characteristic of somebody who is extremely traumatised. 
Like many victims of abuse, this was a woman who did not want to show the world what she was suffering. Ruth's execution at the age of just 28 undoubtedly hastened the abolition of the death penalty, but it was the hanging of a teenager, 19-year-old Derek Bentley, which still resonates to this day. A BBC investigation in 2011 concluded that, in retrospect, it was this case that really spelled the end for capital punishment. Bentley, along with his accomplice, Christopher Craig, were stealing from a warehouse when they were confronted by the police. Craig fled, but Bentley was arrested and was alleged to have shouted, let him have it, moments before Craig shot dead PC Sydney Miles. As Craig was only 16, Bentley would hang for the murder. Derek Bentley had a mental age of something like 11, that he came from a rather disturbed background. These facts were withheld from the jury at the trial. He had certainly not been the leader breaking into this uh, warehouse. Uh, he'd been easily captured by the police. And the police simply said that he had shouted out to Craig as he came up onto the roof, let him have it. As part of the defence, it was said, maybe if he had said this, he had said, let him have it, Chris, why was it necessarily taken as, let him have it, let him have both barrels? Could it not equally have meant, let him have the gun? The case rested on the prosecution's assumption that let him have it was an encouragement to shoot the policeman. But many of the public disagreed with this interpretation. And there was even doubt that he had said this at all. There was somebody who was sent to the gallows, who did not fire the shot, who may actually have been asking his accomplice to give the gun over to the police. And lastly, if that case had come after 1957, he would have got off on terms of diminished responsibility. For those three reasons, it was a seminal case. To believe them... Derek Bentley received a posthumous pardon in 1993. Throughout the fierce debate over capital punishment, historians and filmmakers sought to document miscarriages of justice, as well as the brutal realities of hanging. The evidence they assembled was crucial in shaping the arguments for and against the death penalty, which continue to this day. And may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. But it wasn't just death penalty reform that marked the 1960s out as an era of seismic shifts. Another change in the law would transform the lives of tens of thousands, almost overnight. For many of us, this is revolting, men dancing with men. Homosexuals in this country today break the law. Parliament has been asked to consider a private member's bill legalising homosexual acts between consenting adults and private. But a change in the law doesn't guarantee a change in attitude by the rest of us. It's estimated that one man in 20 is a homosexual. In the heterosexual world, the homosexual disturbs conformist values, is shunned and perhaps misunderstood. Most homosexuals must lead a secret, dark existence. Gay men risked imprisonment, but perhaps even more pernicious, they couldn't safely seek protection from the law if they were blackmailed or assaulted. This man is a hairdresser. His clients and colleagues would call him queer and wouldn't resent his being so. I was beaten up in a public lavatory and left lying on the floor. It was all rather messy and rather nasty, I'm afraid. Who by? I don't know. By a man who, in fact, uh, made advances to me, first of all. And, of course, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't call the police. Homosexuality was something that was just not talked about. If it was ever mentioned, homosexuality was seen as a problem. These were deviants, these were evil people who engaged in depraved acts. In some jobs... This is a documentary film which really does deserve the name. Now half a century old, it feels like a historical document, recording perceptions, attitudes, even a tone of voice 
that's wholly disappeared. Most homosexuals dread getting old, dread losing their looks, fear in particular the final loneliness of living without a companion. Like men needing wives, they search for someone with whom they can establish a lasting relationship which includes warmth and protection as well as sex. These two have done that, have lived together for 26 years. They might almost be a married couple, but they're still queer. Have they been happy? Compared with a lot of married couples, reasonably, yes, reasonably happy. What's the thing you particularly wish for? I wish I had... Um, I yes. wish I was normal, in that way. Yes, I, I think so. Everything is made for married people. It's not made for people like us. It's, things are awkward, aren't they? Did you fall in love with each other? I think I can speak for you. No, you didn't fall in love with me, did you? No. I thought I did with him. But you say you didn't fall in love at all. You didn't even think you were in love. With my friend here? Mm. No. No. Consider the courage of the men interviewed in this film, including a village GP. Have you found, in the course of your career, that being a homosexual has been a disadvantage at all as far as your patients were concerned? Uh, not in the least, no. Not as far as my patients were concerned, no. In a way, I, uh, I might almost say I think at times it's been an advantage, particularly when dealing with um, women. I think some people might be slightly appalled at the idea of having a homosexual doctor, particularly if they were going to have take small sons to him, for instance. Yes. Did you find this? No, I didn't find it because uh, my patients um, either didn't know or else they were um, civilized, civilized enough not in any way to show it to me. Do you think there's any cure for homosexuality? Um, I don't know. I suppose it depends on how strongly you want to be cured. Would you like to be cured? No. Why not? I'm perfectly happy the way I am. I have no desire to be heterosexual. I don't see any advantages um, in being heterosexual, uh, except in the fact that one might have police protection, but um, no, no, I have no desire to change. <laughs> When this film appeared, the Sexual Offences Bill, decriminalising gay sex for men over 21, was making slow progress through Parliament. At no time was a gay lifestyle represented as something to be chosen or to be championed or to be celebrated. I mean, far from it. All that, of course, was uh, uh, to be contrasted with probably what was going on uh, covertly and, and privately, because a lot of the people who profess to be disgusted and almost everybody who spoke in Parliament pro professed to be disgusted were, were probably gay men themselves and knew gay men, were related to gay men, but they couldn't claim any of those affiliations at all. This was such a kind of taboo, dangerous, murky subject. <laughs> Just as with capital punishment, it was interesting that it was the church who were really behind this, particularly the Archbishop of Canterbury, who made it his position very clear in the House of Lords that he felt that it was not the role of the state to criminalise what two consenting men did in private. This was absolutely maybe a sin, but it was not a crime. Gay sex for women had never been criminalised. In the second of this 1965 two-part series, the BBC talked to lesbians about their lives. They are all women at this party, lesbians. There's no law to stop them consenting privately to be lovers. No parliamentary discussion about their behaviour. And yet, for women who love women, unqualified acceptance by our society still does not exist. Steve Rogers and her girlfriend don't often walk down a street for pleasure. There's too much risk involved. Risk of public mockery, undisguised amazement, crude jokes. Many lesbians, of course, aren't so aggressively masculine as Steve, and for them it's not so bad. But for Steve, who's 24, and whose whole instinct cries out to her to feel and act like a man, her appearance makes her constantly vulnerable. When I was 15, 
I met this girl and um, I was with her for six months and I got engaged to her. I really forgot that I was a woman. And uh, she thought she was pregnant. Because <sighs> there's some things that a lesbian you know, can use. And I got away with using one of those. She and she didn't gonna... know the difference, no. And uh, the next thing I know, her mother kept on about us getting married. So I thought, oh, I better get out of it, you know, because I knew I couldn't get married to her. And so then I hopped it, and next thing I know, the police are after me. The girl thinks she's pregnant, and they're taking me to court for breach of promise and that. They took me to court, and then it all came out that I was a girl. On the 5th of July 1967, the bill finally became law, though Scotland and Northern Ireland were denied similar legislation until 1980 and 1982, respectively. We only see partial decriminalisation at this time. The legislation uh, was clear that, that the act had to be consensual, it also had to be in private, and that both the adults had to be over the age of 21. Um, and this was very strictly enforced. So private really did mean private. It didn't even mean a hotel. It also uh, meant that only two men could be in the house at any one time. So if there was a third person in the house, they were, they were potentially committing an offence. So very, very strictly enforced. And I think that just reflects the fact that there was still a level of unease about legislation in this area area uh, and the law reflecting that. What's astonishing to me is how quickly the notion of gay pride emerged from the shadows of the criminal era. In 1972, activists launched the newspaper Gay News, soon to become a standard bearer in the battle for gay rights, with a reputation for pushing society's boundaries. Members of the jury, do you find Gay News Limited guilty or not guilty of blasphemous libel? Just ten years after the first tentative law reform, Gay News was itself making headlines. An erotic poem using religious imagery so incensed the campaigner Mary Whitehouse that she accused the paper's editor, Dennis Lemon, of blasphemy. These things hit at the very foundation of what makes men men and women women. In December 76, Mary Whitehouse solicitors applied to a judge in chambers, Mr Justice Bristow, for leave to bring the case to court. 4th of July, 1977. Early that morning, Dennis Lemon arrived to stand his trial. And he wasn't alone. We come along basically because we see this as a political trial. I'm here to protest and to see what other gay people are doing. I'm gay and a Christian, and I'm, I find the whole trial for blasphemy and of this particular poem very worrying on, on both counts, I think. As we were not allowed to take our cameras inside the Old Bailey, this courtroom is a reconstruction. At 10.25, the public were allowed into the gallery. Most were supporters of gay news. The Crown say that it's quite obvious that the poem portrays Jesus Christ as a practicing homosexual and utterly promiscuous. If you look at it, you will find at least 15 identifiable individuals with whom Jesus Christ is alleged to have committed buggery. Can you imagine anything more promiscuous? It's not just that TV burst into colour between 1967 and 1977. Why this film seems to me to be something of a milestone is that it records how gays confidently challenged the establishment over something other than their own sexuality. Yes, they were arguing over a poem. What they were also saying is, we're queer and we're here. Gay News lost the case and Dennis Lemon was fined £500. But gay campaigners had now certainly found their voice fighting a historic case. This was the last private prosecution for blasphemous libel uh, uh, and we, we didn't see it abolished in law until 2008, although not used since that famous case. 
When filmmakers marked the 30th anniversary of gay law reform, they paid tribute to the newspaper's role. For many gay people, this was their first taste of a whole new world opening up to them. I remember reading it from cover to cover, over and over and over. I'm like, this is my world? This is, I'm not alone here, there's millions of us. And when I seen the contact ads, I was like, I can't believe this. Because you do, man, you think you're the only one. You know, you think, hold on a minute. And it was like, it was like holding it close to me. I'm just even touching it and carrying it around me and stuff like this and with it and in my pocket. It was like, look at me, you know, I'm gay, they're not saying it, you know, please be behind me and read gay news. By the 1990s, the era of furtive criminality was just a distant memory. No longer are there a dozen or so men dancing in some dingy basement. Thirty years on, the dance floor is positively heaving. For one day each year, thousands of gay people of all ages come out onto the streets of London in a defiant show of pride in their sexuality. The film shows how reform in just one specific area of the law can reshape society. From its humble beginning in 1971, when a few hundred GLF members marched through London, pride now demonstrates how far things have changed for lesbian and gay people in Britain. By the late 1990s, both the law and public attitudes had changed beyond recognition from those documented in the first BBC films. History shows that gay law reform can be called a resounding success, yet reformers have been struggling since the 1970s to bring about change in another key area. Then, as now, the issue of how to deal with the crime of rape to ensure justice for both the accuser and the accused was a problem still seeking a solution. The charge in this case is rape, unlawful sexual intercourse with a woman. Forty years ago, Parliament substantially revised the law surrounding rape, prompting an ambitious, innovative inquiry by the BBC. Or not consent to it. The act of rape is defined for the first time in an act of parliament which came into force exactly one month ago. There is for the first time a statutory definition of rape. Secondly, the principle upheld by the Lord's ruling that a man's reasonable or unreasonable belief in a woman's consent must be taken into account is both confirmed and clarified. Thirdly, there is anonymity for the complainant and for the defendant until and if he is convicted. And lastly, there are restrictions on evidence relating to the woman's previous sexual history. You're Rita Jones, aren't you? Why would you know a thing like that? I remember you from school. I used to be a mate of your boyfriend. A drama portrays a meeting, then a sexual encounter between two young people. I've quietened down since then. Me, I'm a good girl now. But is what happened rape? One of the panel of experts asked to interpret what they've seen is Christmas Humphreys, latterly a judge, and the man who prosecuted Ruth Ellis 22 years earlier. What we really have to consider, let's be human and human beings about it, is the case, and it is the most common that I've known, where the girl allows the man to go a certain way but the time comes, oh no, not that, it's too late. The man has got... But why is it that a woman's no is commonly interpreted by men to mean yes? Well, forgive me, may I just finish? The man is getting excited physically. The girl has allowed him to go quite a long way. He's even got a bra off. He's even handling her, feeling her, kissing her passionately. She's responding to some extent. Then comes the time when she says no. Well, no, 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 yes, darling, don't be silly. There's a lot of wildly excited, emotional play of two persons, probably young, both 
in the grip of a power almost beyond themselves. But you're suggesting that women are in some sense guilty of being women and that by virtue of being women they are likely to unleash uncontrollable forces in men against which they must be no. permanently on their guard. No, they no, get, no, forgive me, they get... That. And I think I must come in here. He's saying right. that women don't have equal sexual passions to men, which is a load <laughs> of rubbish. I am as equally sexual as any man and if I can say no and stop then so can any man. Remember that Christmas Humphreys helped ensure that Ruth Ellis's crime of passion resulted in her execution. Is he saying here that there's a point at which passion exonerates a rapist? You don't uh, have to answer questions miss, it is your right. The film imagines the scene when the young woman reports what's happened. Were you wearing that t-shirt all evening? I told you. I wanted to throw everything away. My mum made me put all my clothes in the washing machine. Miss Jones, in here, you claim to have been raped. I have been raped! Well, that's not for me to decide. That's for a jury. A senior policewoman on the panel explains why the complainant has such a tough time. We've got first to establish the offence occurred. Then we need as many details of the offence and as quickly as possible if we're going to secure a prisoner. To some extent you want to test not only the truthfulness of your witness but the stamina of your witness because she pro the case will probably hinge on what she is going to say. Rape's a serious charge to make. You do realise that? I'm not making any charges. I'm telling you what happened. Just thought you might be interested. That fictional account was mirrored five years later in an extraordinary way. If it's not true what you're telling us then, uh, you know, it's going to look a bit uh, difficult for you, isn't it? What did I say? I wasn't raped. No, well, you know, there's a possibility. You know, people come into the police station and they say all sorts of things. They make this them. film proved shocking in the apparently heartless treatment of a woman who'd gone to the police saying she'd been raped by three men. I think. Uh... She probably consented part the way and found her going a bit too far. She thinks she... BBC filmmakers were allowed to follow officers of the Thames Valley Police in one of the first so-called fly-on-the-wall documentaries. So were officers testing a flimsy story or bullying a vulnerable woman? Listen to me. I've been sitting here 20 minutes, half an hour listening to you. Some of it's the biggest lot of bollocks I've ever heard. I can get very annoyed very shortly. I'm sick and tired of the ups and downs and the ins and outs. Some of this is better fairy tales than bloody Gretel can do. Now stop mucking us all about. I'm not mucking you about. Well, I'm not saying to you as you're lying. Get rid of the fruitiness and let's get down to no, facts and yeah, figures. Yeah, well, is it? Well, some of it is. All this crap about bus stops and numbers and blue and white tea towels to wipe myself down with. What the hell's gone on? If nothing's gone on, let's all pack it off and go home. It's clear that the officers in this case are, are bullying and cajoling the woman. Well, this is the biggest bollocks I've ever heard. I will agree that maybe you've had sex this afternoon. And it's not with your boyfriend. But I'll go as far as to say, I think that you've been a willing party to it. I think the police in this case thought that they were acting in an extremely professional way. They were aware that they were being filmed for this documentary to show the human side of policing. Of course, they, they came across as far from humane. You're not upset by it. You haven't taken the blind bit of notice of anything that's gone on. The story you've told us is, like my colleagues, a fairy tale. The film caused outrage. Thames Valley Police responded by setting up a specialist rape unit staffed by women officers and many other forces followed suit. The impact of the film was apparent nine years later when filmmakers went inside London's Met Police training school. Do any of you remember seeing the programme on the Thames Valley Police a few years ago? And what I'll do is I'll show you a very quick clip and let you watch it and then we'll have a little discussion about it later. Okay. Well, I don't know exactly, but it was... I think, I think it's the Mead Way Road. Is it Mead Way Road? Is there such a road as that? Yeah. Listen to me. I've been sitting here 20 minutes, half an hour listening to you. Some of it's the biggest lot of bollocks I've ever heard. I can get very annoyed very shortly. If something's gone on and you think, well, that's an experience, that's life, all right. That's what I do think. This is the biggest bollocks I've ever heard.
What do you think of that then? You just don't speak to people like that. Mm -hmm. And that is just disgusting, the way that that, that officer spoke. We can clearly see a fly on the wall documentary, which in a sense is reflecting what's going on, uh, actually leading to um, policy change in the police. So an extremely powerful documentary and one that I would use when I was teaching students uh, about uh, developments in rape law, that how a documentary can, can bring about or can start the process of change. Filmmakers are present as a young woman describes being abducted and raped by three men. The one in the front, in the passenger seat, he leant back and locked my door, you know, and then I unlocked it again and I opened it again. And I said, listen, I don't want this rubbish. I said, I'm getting out of your car now. And so this one next to me shut my door and pulled me back. And then um, they stopped, you know, just suddenly they knew where they were going, they just stopped. If there's anything you don't understand or you don't like, you just say, you remain in control of this. It's a very different atmosphere from the experience in Thames Valley. But despite this completely new approach, the woman ultimately withdraws her complaint. Why? We want these men punished for what they did to you. We'd like a statement from you. We need a detailed statement about what happened to you. My suspicion in this case is that here's a woman who was forced to have sex with three men against her will but who knew that there was no way that she could go through successfully a claim of that sort in court without being taken apart. And that's what so many women feel. I must say that I think the delegation is true. I think there are many, many things uh, during the investigation that make me uncomfortable, but I think at the end of the day, I'm satisfied that an offensive rape took place. The evidence seems to be that here's a problem without an easy solution, perhaps without any solution, when filmmakers revisited the subject in 2001, their findings were depressingly familiar. Last year, nearly 8,000 women reported being raped to the police. That's about 20 women every day. But although nearly 90% of women can identify their attackers, and in spite of the reforms in the way the police and courts deal with victims of rape, less than 10% will see them convicted. A young woman, attacked on her way home from a pub, describes her experience. He started kissing me and I pushed him away and I had my hands between my chest and his and I physically pushed him and said, no, look, I don't want to do this. And he carried on. When I was taken to the rape suite, you have to walk into a room and strip off your clothes bit by bit until you're wearing absolutely nothing. I think the worst thing was that I had to have a, a male doctor to examine me, to take all the swabs they needed and everything. At the time, I just didn't want anybody touching me. In this case, the complainant is determined to follow the process through, but it's not that simple. Even if the police think a case is worth pursuing, a quarter of those passed to the Crown Prosecution Service will be sent back due to a lack of evidence. In Susie's case, her attacker had been arrested and charged, but two months later, the case was dropped. I spoke to the CPS and I said, why can't you let a jury decide whether they believe me or not? He basically said that there was no way because it was my word against his and they wouldn't take it any further. There was, there was nothing could be done now. Only 9% of all reported cases end in a conviction for rape. That means that either 90% of women are making it up or they're being failed by the criminal justice system. I've seen how over 40 years, BBC filmmakers followed the story of how lawmakers and the police have tried to deal with rape. These documentaries charted and sometimes drove change. But the evidence seems to be that little has changed for victims. 
they have tried through the introduction of legislation to make the situation easier um, for women giving evidence uh, in court. They have also introduced the Victims Code to try again and support vulnerable witnesses, although I'm not sure I mean, it's clear that more needs to be done uh, to support women through this extremely harrowing journey. And we definitely haven't got it right yet. We've looked at specific attempts to change, to improve the law over the last half century or so, but perhaps the most profound change to emerge from the evidence of the film archive is in how we as citizens regard the judicial system. Are we certain that our courts always deliver justice? And in particular, should we have implicit trust in the police? Wanted for housebreaking at 43 Dalmore Street City, John Charlesworth, alias Johnny. This film, now almost 60 years old, looks at the work of the Birmingham police in an era where the friendly Bobby knew everyone on his beat, villains too, and cheerily dispensed a clip round the ear to young delinquents. Walk at the regulation pace of two and a half miles an hour. I'm on duty eight hours. There's 200 of us on the beat. Why, that's 4,000 miles of walking. Some shoe leather. It's a long walk for the police in Birmingham. Every year, more than 12,000 crimes are committed in this city alone. There is no pause in the war on crime. But things were changing. The 60s were a time when, as we've seen, old certainties were being challenged. And one of those certainties was an unquestioning faith in the police. By 1970, filmmakers sensed that this faith had grown increasingly fragile. Hello, hello, hello. What's going on here? The police box, that reassuring reminder of law and order, is out of date. For many people, so is our traditional view of what law and order mean. The British policeman was invented 150 years ago to cope with violent mobs. Somewhere along the line, he acquired a reputation for being everybody's friend. The policeman's world grows harsher, society more chaotic. Can the traditional Bobby outlive these changes? In the reality of what was going on in the police world, there are always scandals, there have always been corruption, there always will be. It was just that I think the media in the late 60s took on board that it was their job to act as the fourth estate to be watchdogs. A film in 1971 asked whether the police themselves were above the law. Violence during a political demonstration in Grosvenor Square outside the American Embassy. Scenes which most of us remember. For anyone who wants to complain against the police, the procedure is not one of open trial, but a matter for private investigation by the police into a complaint against the police. Just three years after that film was made, a chain of events was set in motion that would shake, maybe even for a time destroy, whatever confidence remained in the British judicial system. In November 1974, the biggest mass murder Britain had then ever witnessed took place in Birmingham. The bombing of the Tavern in the Town and the Mulberry Bush pubs by the IRA killed 21 people and injured 162. Six men were arrested for the bombings only hours later. Though we can't be certain, some of those young policemen filmed in 1957 may actually have taken part in the investigation. During the next three days in police custody at Morecambe and later in Birmingham, four of the men confessed to the bombings. Samples were taken from their fingernails and tested for nitroglycerine to discover if they'd been handling explosives. Their hands were swabbed with cotton wool soaked in ether 
the swab then tested for nitroglycerin. The trial at Lancaster Crown Court lasted almost seven weeks amid tight security. The men were brought under heavy guard to the specially constructed semicircular dock. 21 times the charge of murder was read out to each of the six men accused of the killings. 21 times each of them replied not guilty. The trial judge, Mr Justice Bridge, sentenced the men to life. He said, you stand convicted on the clearest and most overwhelming evidence I have ever heard. If the Birmingham Six appeared with signs of beatings, bruises, in a climate where it was like a war, um, people were scared, no one knew when the next attack was going to come, people would have disregarded that. It would have been seen as part of the course. But the greatest the relief would have been that these men had been brought to justice. But gradually, doubts began to circulate. Were the men in jail guilty after all? First Granada Television, then other filmmakers, began to raise serious questions about the case. Since the surprise release of the Guildford Four, who also claimed the police forced confessions from them, attention is once again on the Birmingham Six. People now know that the police are capable of fabricating evidence and um, engineering convictions, so we do have the world on our side at the moment and we are sure they're going to get out, so we're in a good mood. I want to see David Mornington very soon at the dispatch box in the House of Commons saying the Birmingham Six are innocent and must be released immediately. It was claimed that the confessions had been beaten out of the six men arrested, that forensic evidence was faked, or at least fatally compromised, that the prosecution case was built on a tissue of false evidence presented by some Birmingham police officers. A former constable who'd been on duty at Aston in Birmingham when the men were being interrogated confirmed their serious allegations. These men had been hit. There is no doubt about it. They've been hammered. How can you be so sure? I could see the bruises on the face, the puffiness around the eyes, um, and the fear. A former policewoman, Joyce Linus, who left the force with an exemplary record, told the court that she had seen the men intimidated. There were two other officers either side of the man, and they stood him up, and the officer in front said, this is what we do and then continues to swear at the man um, and then need him in the groin and he was obviously in a lot of agony. The allegations struck right at the heart of the judicial system. At best they suggested gross incompetence, at worst a conspiracy to defeat the ends of justice. The men's lawyers began a civil action against the police and the Home Office for the injuries allegedly inflicted during police custody. But the case never came to court. Lord Denning upheld a West Midlands police appeal against the action. He's admitted that was a mistake. I'm now shown to be wrong. I was wrong in this case, so I think there'll be great pressure on the Home Secretary to reopen the case of the Birmingham Six. It's my view that those convictions are almost certainly unsafe and unsatisfactory, and so the case should be looked at again and looked at very carefully. When this film was broadcast, the men were still in jail. The jury was, so to speak, still out, but not for much longer. At five past four this evening came the moment six Irishmen had waited for for 16 years, three months and 21 days. In 1991, the appeal court decided that the convictions were no longer sustainable. The six men were released. Less than half an hour after the end of the hearing, the men were out on the streets of London, breathing the fresh air of freedom in exchange for that of a prison cell. The evidence of this last case is that public trust in the honesty and simple capability of the British criminal justice system suffered a profound shock. There was such an outrage at the bombings that the police were under extraordinary pressure to get a result very quickly and to use uh, improper methods, and it all boomeranged back on them. I think the judiciary has a great temptation, particularly more recently, 
to be uh, rather incredulous about you know the absolute veracity of uh, uh, police evidence. It's worth remembering where we started this examination with arguments for and against the death penalty. The Birmingham bombings took place just five years after Parliament voted to halt executions. It's almost certain the six would have been hanged. A warning made more than half a century ago sounds very prescient today. If we hang an innocent man or woman, as from time to time we have, we deprive ourselves by this form of punishment of any opportunity to right the wrong. And what a wrong. England prides itself on being the most gentle country in the world. We are tolerant. We forgive easily. We care for what is small and helpless. We detest violence as a foreign vulgarity. Looking back through the archive, I'm struck by how much that's there has, I think, a priceless quality. To the burglar and the cracksman, to the petty thief and the prostitute, the greatest source of danger is the patrolling policeman. If it seems a little quaint to us now, imagine how alien it might seem in 100, 200 years' time. These films allow us to analyse how our society has evolved, how, in this case, our perceptions of crime and punishment have changed. If you think back to the 60s, television had been home to the general public for 10 years. You had, what, two... 